Now, residents of mine here and adjoining communities here in Accra on Monday said lawyer tires are blazing blocked roads linking the communities to the rest of the city to protest the poor nature of their roads. They say they have been compelled to resort to demonstrations to get their roads fixed because their complaints have been largely ignored. Joining us is Maxwell Agbagwa, monitored the situation and has come through with this report. It's rather a chaotic scene here at Ablekuma Boko Boko and its adjoining communities um, like Manhia. Residents here are setting ties ablaze right in the middle of the road. They are protesting over bad roads. In fact, when we're driving here, we have to go through some deep gullies that run through um, the middle of the road. The residents today are saying we are going to prevent any commercial or private vehicle that's going to the central business district of Accra. And that is exactly what they are doing even the students the students they are going to school they can't even they are making late always always the teachers are complaining why the, the children are making late so i think governors will come and do something about it do you think this is the best way to go about this is, is this the best way to get your issues resolved yes of course yes of course i think if they, they do uh, yeah take smoke a billowing ride from the middle of the streets Commercial activities here have been grinded to a halt. Residents here will not allow any commercial vehicle to move to the central business district. As the chief of this area, he was nearly arrested by the police. They nearly bundled him into their vehicle, but he's lucky to be here now. Chief, what is the problem here in this community? The problem over here is there are some things which is going on in the area which you don't understand it. Complaining about this road, how long have you been complaining? We've been complaining for long. We've been complaining for quite about 16 years ago. They usually make demonstration in the area. And at times, we usually went to the assembly and give reports at the assembly. But they'll give us information that they were coming to do it. By right now, they will not do it. This is a second location here at Ablekuma Mania, where residents have set a number of ties ablaze. What police officers have moved into this community and they are trying to find a solution to this. They want to quench the fire, but these uh, residents here will not allow them to do their work. In fact, we can turn so you can see um, the fire in the background. A number of ties set ablaze uh, by the residents here in this community. Police officers here are finding it very difficult to move in here. The road is already given to contract. And in my own presence, he called the woman that is the contractor. Because it was by this time in June, July, she said after the rain stop, that's August, September, they will come and do the rain. But still, but still up to now. Up the roads here do not only pose a challenge to us living in this community. Public relations officer of the Greater Accra Police says it can also pose an impediment to police mobility in this community. To be told, because a place like this, usually, when the, the, the roads are very bad, it creates some for, form of impediment in our combating crime. Uh, the residents here have actually blocked the main road. These people here, I mean, if you want to go to the other side of this community, you would have to cross this little stream here before. You cannot use the main stretch. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. We cannot cross the road because there's thick smoke billowing from the middle of the road as a result of the ties that have been set ablaze. We just have to do this. We have no choice. You see? Right, so the very latest we're getting uh, from Mangia is that the police, they're telling us that they've uh, deployed personnel there to ensure that there is order. We've been speaking with ASP Efiatenge. He, she's a PRO of the Accra Region Police. Uh, we have been able to mobilize some men into the community, that's the Gang West municipality. And uh, 
we have men on ground to ensure that the situation is had in the morning does not escalate. Why did you have to send um, officers into the area? Oh, that morning we had an information that there's some angry youth within the Ghana West municipality there have blocked the roads where their car ties and they have set them ablaze all in protest of bad nature of the road. So we quickly had to also respond to the situation. First of all, we began with a, a patrol team that went to the area to assess the situation. And when we realized that a reinforcement was needed, we had to send more deployments to the area. Then again, some officers from the region also had to had to follow up to ensure that we brought the situation under control. They were blocked about three parts of the road. So right from the beginning of the road, you have um, even a place closer to a filling station. They set the, the car ties ablaze and it was very dangerous there. We were able to quench it from there. Then we had to move to another bridge, and that's where the Maya itself was. And even that place, too, we also had over 60 ties that were set up, please. And it took the fire service about 10 to 15 minutes to be able to quench um, that fire. Well, the Maniya community and its adjoining towns fall within two municipalities, Gang West and the Gang Central municipality. The MC for Gang Central, Dr. Emmanuel Lamte, tells your news. Even though a larger chunk of the area falls within the Gang West municipality, he will ensure that paperwork is fast-tracked for the contractor to get back to work and fix the roads. The road, it's, it's at the heart of everybody, and everybody wants our roads to be, to be improved. For the people of Manhia, apart from the road network, they do not have any major difficulty. I want you to wrap up by telling the people of Manhia what exactly you intend to do for them. I think when you look at Mahia, for instance, larger proportion of it falls within Gang West. Larger proportions of it fall within Gang West. It is not in our in our municipality. What uh, part of it falls within your municipality? It, it, yes, just just a small part of it falls within the municipality, and we want to assure them, the people of Mahia and other areas that are linked to Abrekuma, that we will put the the pressure on the contractor. And wherever the certificates uh, have gotten to, we will also try to uh, talk to the people, the authorities concerned, for those certificates to be handed in time uh, so that they can have our road fixed uh, for, for us. Sometimes it leads to uh, most of the contractors care additional expenses because if you have leveled and compacted uh, the road, and you're waiting for a certificate uh, funds to come into your account. Exactly what happened on the manual project. Yes. Then later on, you have to spend additional money putting that right again and re uh, graveling and uh, uh, smoothing it and compacting it again. It creates an additional challenges uh, to them. Uh, but as I indicated earlier on, we will put, we'll try to put pressure on the contractors and also try to talk to uh, wherever the certificates have uh, gotten to, talk to the people so that those certificates will be handed in time for us to have our roads uh, fees for them. Now the phone line now is the MC for Gan West Municipality, Clement Ni Lamte Wilkinson, and uh, he's also to tell us what plans he has for his area. Good evening to you, sir. Now this uh, road your people are protesting over looks really bad. Are there any plans to fix it anytime soon? Good evening, sir. Um, yeah, that is true. Today uh, we had a, um, a demonstration from um, a resident of uh, uh, Mahia, Takena, Uduman. Uh, they are protesting against their bad route. Um, we went there, we met them, and we, we had a, a discussion with them. So my question is, are there any plans to fix it anytime soon? Oh, yes. Um, I think um, we, we, we are trying to do something by tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, we call upon the contractor to um, embark on the route so that uh, they will be having a, they, they can have uh, a more travel route for, from tomorrow um, to Friday. Um, the contractor will come back and work on the, on the road. 
All right, so the police are also telling us that they have deployed some personnel to the area to ensure that there is calm. Are you able to speak to this? Yeah, yeah. Um, in the morning, when the situation happened, I think uh, Greater Accra Regional Commander and um, his team, um, the PRO, Mami Afia Tengu, they came around. Um, Amatama Commander and um, I think Anya Commander, all of them, they were around because the crowd was so huge that they, they have to come around to calm down the crowd. Um, um, as I'm speaking now, everything is calm. And by tomorrow, I think uh, everybody can walk around without any problem. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wilkinson. He is the Gant West uh, Municipal Chief Executive. And we're moving on uh, to another community which has seen some trouble. The police on Monday arrested seven persons in a standoff with some residents of Somenya who were protesting the arrest of an assemblyman in the area. The police had moved into the area to arrest the popular assemblyman, Ebenezer Jones Adamate, who has been accused of inciting residents against the electricity company of Ghana. A confrontation, however, ensued during which the police station there was attacked and property destroyed. The police eventually managed to pick up the assemblyman, but four other suspects who were being held at the Sovenia police station escaped in the melee. And the police is asking the public to volunteer information about the suspects. Now, Monday's riots follow a similar run on the offices of the electricity company of Ghana at Sovenia over the high electricity bills. The residents say is slapped on them by ECG. We are joined on the line by Easting Region Police PROSP Ebenezer Tete with the very latest. Good evening to you, Mr. Tete. Hello, Mr. Tete. Hello, uh, my sp do we have uh, ASP Ebenezer Tete on the line? Right, we will take a break. It appears we're having difficulties uh, getting him to hear us. We will take a quick break and come back and hopefully we'll have him on the line. Welcome back to Join News Prime. We're going back to our earlier story in Somenya, where police on Monday arrested seven persons in a standoff with some residents who were protesting the arrest of assemblyman in the area. The police had moved into the area to arrest the popular assemblyman Ebenezer Jones Adamate, who has been accused of inciting residents against the electricity company of Ghana. A confrontation, however, ensued during which the police station there was attacked and property destroyed. The police eventually managed to pick up the assemblyman, but four other suspects who were being held at the Soanya police station escaped in the melee, and the police is asking the public to volunteer information about the suspects. Now, Monday's riots followed a similar run on the offices of the electricity company of Ghana at Somenya. Over the high electricity bills, the residents say it slapped on them by the ECG. We're joined on the line by the Eastern Region Police PROSP Ebenezer Tete with the very latest. Good evening to you and thank you for your time. We understand there's been quite some destruction to property as a result of Monday's uh, riots. What is the state of security currently in the town as we speak? Hello, so, hello, ASP Ebenezer Tete. Can you hear me? Right, we're having uh, challenges with your phone line. We're moving on to other stories. The Minister of State in charge of public procurement, Sarah Adrasafo, is accusing the former NDC administration of using sole sourcing under the public procurement law to loot state funds. According to her, apart from the award of contracts to friends and cronies under dubious circumstances, most of the contracts were inflated. Addressing a program to train ministers and other public officials on procurement, Ajua Safo said her office is in the process of reviewing all such contracts to advise government on what to do with them. She assured under her watch the law will be strengthened and due attention given to the economy and value for money when awarding public contracts. I must assure you that under the watch of His Excellency, the President Lanado Dankwe Kufuado, and the Vice President, appropriate steps 
will be taken under our tenure of office to stop this wanton abuse of sole sourcing as a method of government contracts. We are compiling a list of all ongoing contracts and projects with all government institutions in order to advise government whether or not to proceed or abrogate such contracts. Again, number two, investigating the procurement processes and procedures that each procurement entity went through before awarding government construct, contracts to any public sector person in order to ascertain the level of compliance. Three, my office will come up with a policy document on 70% of government contracts or projects for our local companies or industries and also ensure that 30% of that 70% goes to women, companies owned by women, persons with disability, and the youth in employment. This was a manifesto promise that we made to the people of Ghana before we took office. And my office would make sure that we, we would um, implement these policies to the best of our abilities. Well, Vice President uh, Dr. Mamadou Bao may also announce measures to ensure public contracts undergo stringent processes to avoid corruption, which according to him constitutes 90% of malfeasance in the public sector. Uh, First Lady Rebecca Kufuado has cut sword for work to begin on a new mother and baby unit at the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital in the Ashanti Regional Capital. This follows the second successful fundraising event at the Minshia Palace in Kumase with support from the Sante Henio Tunfo Osei Tutu II and his wife Lady Julia Tutu Osei Tutu. The initiative was inspired by a joint new special assignment documentary, Next to Die. The First Lady Rebecca Kufado expressed optimism the new unit will be completed in the next four months. By the grace of God, I think we can begin work as soon as possible to stop uh, our newborn babies from dying unnecessarily. The babies are our future, the children are our future, and we cannot sit by and allow this to happen. And so we are going to cut the sword very soon for the new mother and baby unit, which should be ready in the next four months. And to the contractor, we will provide all the support that you would need to get the work going. And may God see us through this work all the way through as soon as possible so that we can get uh, full use of it very, very soon. Well, that was a very brief remarks there, brief message there for us from the First Lady, Mrs. Rebecca Akufuado. She told us about how excited and, of course, how happy she is to see this very day. The fact that an initiative that she has embarked upon is going to see the light of day. And at this very moment, we're moving into the grounds where the maternity block, the very new one, will be put up so that the sword cutting will take place. Well, presently, we have uh, the uh, chief executive of the Confanochi Teaching Hospital, Dr. Joseph Akpalu, commended the efforts of the First Lady and the multimedia group. The hospital has for far experienced extreme congestion in most of its operational areas, especially in child health, obstetric, and gynecology directories. This is in view of the fact that hospital receive referral from 10 regions and beyond that of Ghana. And the hospital has not witnessed major expansion in the field of maternity and child health block, but also in others. Efforts to solve this problem of congestion since 1976 when we commenced on the construction of night 
9,095 9, uh, bed maternity and children's block, which is just lying there. We shall continue to count on your kind support in the years ahead, especially regards to the completion of maternity and children's block, which will provide a long-term solution to the problem at the hospital. I cannot bring my address to a close without conveying our gratitude to corporate Ghana and philanthropic individuals who have dug deep into the coffers to support this project. To you all, we are most grateful. The history of this hospital, as far as the story about expansion of the new maternity and mother's unit at Confanoche Teaching Hospital, will never be completed without reference to your remarkable donations. Elsewhere, the neonatal intensive care unit of the Sunyani Regional Hospital in the Brunha Full Region urgently needs more incubators in order to serve the large number of premature babies that are delivered or referred there. The worrying situation, according to head of the pediatric department of the hospital, Dr. Bright Esiama, is to blame for the congestion, which also provides fertile grounds for the spread of infections among babies. Nesta Kafi Ajuma has more in the following report. Several babies born premature across the Brona Hafu region are referred to the Sunyai Regional Hospital for further intensive care without incubators. Others who are delivered at the hospital with the same premature condition still needed the care of incubators. According to Dr. Bright Isiama, the neonatal intensive care units of the hospital receive 30 to 40 premature babies within a month, even though only three incubators are available, out of which two are functional. He stated that ideally 10 incubators are needed for his unit. <laughs> But it's not, it's not certified, so we can't guarantee the effectiveness of the radiance of the light being thrown off the building. But some of the time we work, some of the time it doesn't work. And we may do with it for now. Incubators. But currently it's broken and so it's not functional. Is it repairable? Some of the time, some of the parts, we may not get them in Ghana to repair. So that's some of the challenges that we have. Naturally. Some babies are born with jaundice, a defect that causes a yellowing of the skin and eye in newborn babies. The defect needs infant phototherapy to get corrected, but the equipment being used is not certified. We need incubators in the, in the unit. Can we have uh, three incubators, which, which two are functional now? So we need more incubators. But these incubators are used to care for those who are freshly born, who didn't develop fully in their mothers, even before they were the premature babies. So when they are born, we keep them in the incubators to keep them water, they don't become cool. So we are feeling to them properly. Dr. Isiyama says, the hospital has been using locally made phototherapy for the babies. In order to augment the hospital's effort, lawyer Ama Frimpoma presented one infant phototherapy, infant scale and baby diapers, among others, to the neonatal intensive care unit of the hospital. Ama Frimpoma explains why. And so on my birthday set of me, I told my friends that well, they are kids of suffering in my region. Instead of taking me out in a bar for dinner, instead of buying me a bottle of wine, help me buy something for the hospital. Help me come celebrate my birthday with my friends in here. And so we managed to get a phototherapy machine. Remember we are going up, they said children are born with jaundice. And so they go to keep them in the sun. So there's this new machine that the children who are born with jaundice can be put under and then there are lights that suspend over them. So we bought that and the weighing machine for the hospital. Ibrahim Asari Bediakun expressed gratitude for the donation but ask for more assistance from the public. We are supposed to have about five incubators here. Mm -hmm. But now we are having only three. Mm -hmm. And as you all know, mm -hmm. uh, Madame's donation is worth about 11,000 as an individual. So we are appealing that if more people come together, I think they can do much more than what we are seeing here today. We're taking a break on Joy News Prime, to which we'll bring you a business scene.
Hello again, good evening and welcome to business. My government is insisting measures being implemented to reduce the public debt would start yielding the desired results possibly from June this year. The assurance follows increase in the public debt by 5 billion CDs from December to 127 billion CDs to March. But Deputy Minister of Finance, Kwe Ku Kwatin, tells Joy Business these measures take time before yielding the desired results. We capped earmark funds and it is one of the major interventions in the 2017 budget designed to make it easier for government to manage its expenditures and to have less need to, to, to borrow. Uh, those are the things, but additionally, we are also um, scaling up uh, our use and strengthening of the public finance management regime to deal with waste uh, in revenue mobilization, but also wastage in expenditures. We are looking closely at exemptions. We are looking at uh, reprofiling our existing debt. And all that is designed to reduce government expenditure and to lessen the need to borrow. But some will say that despite all these measures, I look at the latest Bank of Ghana report on the public debt, and let's even just stick with the nominal numbers. It is going up 121, 22 to 127 billion. There have been several reasons that have been given in serious depreciation, but for that ordinary person, that is not still not convincing enough. That shows that this administration is committed to at least managing the space to ensure that things doesn't get worse. I mean, for an administration that has been in office for five months, this is a very uh, respectfully uncharitable commentary. I, I think these interventions will take time to yield fruits. Don't forget that a new government will inherit many li liabilities and you have people coming to you with all kinds of claims of delivering things to, to, to government in the past and you now have to pay. That has to be managed. The interest on money that we have borrowed previously are due. They have to be paid. And so you put in place these strategies so that going forward, the overall need for government to borrow would come down. You do not ex it is not something you do and immediately borrowing stops. Reshaping public expenditure structures, public sector reforms to deliver improvements in efficiency use of public resources and all that are not things you do just like that. And so we have signaled some of these in the budget. Uh, we, uh, we have bega we began implementing some of them, but it, it would take time for all these uh, reform interventions uh, to to have impact. Let's look at the exemptions as well. The World Bank report is talking about the fact that it's quite a huge toll on government's uh, what do you call it revenue as well. Five point something percent of uh, GDP is quite huge. Now, what is the final position on these exemptions? When at the same time, the GIPC and other government agencies are also struggling or pushing to bring in investment by pushing ahead with these policies. Um, the announcement in the 2017 budget was that government was going to do a comprehensive review of the exemptions, exemptions regime. Meanwhile, the World Bank is asking government to do more to reduce the public debt because of its impact on the national budget. According to the bank, the rising interest payments on these debts is affecting funds set aside for projects under the budget. These came to light during a program by the World Bank to review government's expenditure and debt management strategies. Economists with the Institute of Fiscal Studies, Dr. Siyad um, Said Wachi, has been explaining to Joy Business. To the Bank of Ghana website, I'm told that additional 10 billion is about to be raised. Mm -hmm. So borrowing, and of course you cannot end borrowing. The way the country finances are now, if the government doesn't borrow, it will find it very difficult to run the country. Mm -hmm. uh, so are we, except, are should we? <laughs> except that the government is going to be creative in generating certain revenues that 
hated to the country was finding difficult to generate. If it can do so, then it can minimize. But if revenue generation is going to continue as normal, given the position of expenditure and others, the country cannot stop borrowing now. Do you think that we should focus more on the end of fear rather than what has been put out right now? Oh, you're talking about the debt to GDP yes. ratio published by the Bank, yes. Bank of Ghana. You see, for that one, it is a technical issue. Because debt to GDP ratio is you take your total debt, total public debt, divided by GDP. If you were doing this at the end of 2016, you are going to use 2016 GDP and the debt. Now, you are doing that around April 2017. So you are. Your numerator now is debt accumulated until April 2016, S17. But the GDP is the forecasted GDP for the entire year. So automatically, whenever you compute your debt to GDP ratio in the middle of the year, it's going to go down relative to the previous year. But what is most important is that when the year ends and the GDP is realized and the debt that you have accumulated for the entire year is also utilized, then you can know the debt to GDP ratio. And in another development, the finance ministry's plan to issue a 10-year bond to clear the entire energy sector debt is taking shape. The ministry has in a public notice invited bids from institutions that can manage the process of raising the funds. Finance Minister Ken Ophoriata last month disclosed to Joy Business that the government is working on modalities to aid the issuance of the bond. He adds they were planning to use proceeds from the energy sector debt levy to back the bond. Meanwhile, the Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors has welcomed governments quickly uh, to quickly um, clear the energy sector debts. Senor Hossi is CEO of the Chamber. Uh, finance minister has been very progressive on this matter. I mean, he takes it serious and I must commend him for that. The implications on our industry, the implications on the banking sector, is quite dire, so it can't be taken for granted. So you've seen that seriousness being attached to it. Uh, we've had a couple of meetings, both at the SPV level. Um, uh, you know, you as you're aware, we have an SPV, which I, am, I, I happen to be the managing director for with the banks, jointly owned by the banks and the BDCs as well. And um, the sessions have been progressive. We are hoping to have the commissioning of on audit into all the claims that are yet to be validated. And the ones that are validated, we'll start looking at payments. And as the minister has indicated, it's going to be part of the energy bond. Uh, I think the 2.5 billion they are considering. Well, even 3.5 billion. So I mean, billion. yes, that's that's possible. But it's going to be CD bond. So I, I mean, I, my, often my, my advice to government and, and when they speak about CD denominated bonds is that they actually keep it with with CD um, CD values, with there's no 2.5 billion or 3.5 billion dollar bonds because they are not they are not going to be uh, dollar bonds. They are going to be CD bonds to, to cover our part of the debt, cover some part, and it's it's a fantastic idea. It helps warehouse the problem, cure the problem, and get the banking industry and the active energy sectors back into active operation or proper operation. Away from the public sector debt, British Airways says it is working to restore its computer systems after a power failure caused major disruption for thousands of passengers worldwide. An IT power cut is said to have resulted in mass flight cancellations at Heathrow and Garrick airports in the UK. Speaking on the marketplace earlier, Russell Patmore of the BBC says the situation which can be described as a calamity to the international airline has led to a great loss of revenue. He was speaking on the marketplace been a real challenge for the airline. Now, things are getting back to normal today, but across the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, British Airways has been forced to cancel something like 800 flights to destinations right across the world. Thousands and thousands of passengers found themselves in a bit of a predicament. Some were being advised to contact the airline to find out if they needed to come to the airport. Some were advised to look at the website and they were getting differing information. The website would say come to the airport, they'd arrive at the airport to be told by staff that they should not have come. And it's been a bit of a challenge for British Airways because there have been allegations that the airline just might have been not investing as much as it should have done in its information technology systems. And the IT system went down. This was the problem, a computer error 
has caused this problem for British Airways. The trade unions have actually accused the airline of outsourcing its computer facilities to companies in India and cutting back on what they would regard as the more professional, more experienced staff working in the UK. So this is going to be a very expensive problem for British Airways. It's going to have to pay a lot of compensation to its customers. Of BBC's Fatmo Russell and in tonight's business. Thanks for watching. My name is Imano Apuachi. We are feeling more ahead. Don't worry. <laughs>Right, for those of you who enjoy your fish, you should know not all the fish out there are safe enough for your consumption. It turns out some of the fishing practices, especially those involving the use of chemicals, end up rather introducing poisonous substances into your fish and putting you at risk. Whilst we wait on government to comprehensively address this problem, Join News' Adelaide Arthur has been engaging some fishmongers on how to tell the good fish from the kind that could put you at risk and why illicit fish is really bad for your health. The color, appearance, smell, and taste of a fish can give an indication as to how it was caught. Fishmongers particularly are very good at telling the difference between fish caught using safe methods and those harvested through illegal means such as light fishing and the use of dynamite. <laughs> Fresh fish caught legally does not turn black when processing, unlike those harvested using the light fishing method. They are usually torn into pieces and have bloodshot eyes. It also smells bad. Madam Akosia Mensiwa, who says she's been in the fishmongering business for about 45 years and has five dependents, had to abandon fish processing due to frequent spoilage. They appear fresh when you buy them from the fishermen, but start discharging smelly liquid after a few minutes and they turn red. They break when I prepare them for processing. They are not appealing when ready for sale. I always lose money because I throw a lot away. I'm still in debt, so I've abandoned the trade and I'm now selling both fruit instead. It's really been difficult. The use of light to attract fishes and subsequently killing them with explosives has gained popularity among some notorious fishermen. These fishermen, what they do is that they use light that's with the help of a generator they carry aboard when they are going and then they dip it into the water and then the fishes are attracted to the light and therefore when they aggregate then they use a net to encircle it. Yeah, they could just harvest it that way, but of course our fishermen want to increase their efficiency. And so with that, they then uh, blast it with dynamite or they can use chemicals to kill it. It's just to ensure that all the species or all the fishes that have been aggregated are dead. Dr. Campion draws a direct link between fishes killed using explosives and chemicals and the rate at which they go bad. If fishes are caught regularly through entanglement, we are talking of them caught in the net, reg the regular fishing method, then of course they take a longer time to die. They die slowly and therefore they don't, the rate of spoilage is also decreased, especially the ones that have been blasted using dynamite. Then, of course, you have them the shock of sudden death. And, of course, blood is suddenly spilled to other parts. So you find that the gills are relatively darker. The whole fish looks bloody. Some are highly mutilated, torn into pieces. Yeah. So, of course, then when you have blood and others mixed up with the fish, then deterioration is faster. Though the fishermen seem to be aware these methods are illegal and harmful to consumers, they argue it is their only means of survival 
considering the rate of depletion of the fish stock. Sayukono, only no one may you bring in our waba. First, no, the main main I am from Kwapu. Because always on what's a podo. It is the psycho fishing practice that has compelled us to engage in illegal fishing. Those engaged in psycho are stationed on the sea and always harvesting fish which we no longer find close to the shore. We now use about two drums of premix fuel, which cost us about 1,400 CDs to enable us to travel further into the sea. It is very expensive to do fishing now, and so we are compelled to use illegal methods, else we won't make any catch. The chief fisherman of Marine Park at Elmina is confident deploying a fish safety testing device at all landing beaches will ensure potentially harmful fresh fish catch does not end up on our plates. We have asked government to introduce test kits at all landing sites to test fish for their safety. We've made this request at several meetings and we've been told it will be considered. For the sake of the many consumers who enjoy fish, whether smoked, dried, fried or grilled, raiding the market of illicit fish should be of utmost importance to the government. Farmers at Awase in the Winchi municipality of the Granhafu region are complaining of massive losses as a result of the invasion of four army worms. Thousands of acres of farmlands have been destroyed as a result of the pest invasion, with maize particularly worst affected. Correspondent Nestor Kafuya Jome has been interacting with some of the farmers in the Awase area and has come through with this report. Some of the farmers in and around Owase in the Wenchi municipality of the Brona Hafu region have invested thousands of Ghana cities just to control the destruction caused by the fall army worms. Others, though, have simply given up because they do not have the financial strength to buy the chemicals. Most of the farmers in this area take the fall army worms that have invaded their farms for just worms, even though they have had assistance from agrarian extension officers who recommended the use of several pesticides without a result. The four army worms invaded our farms last year. We had a hard time destroying them. The four army worms showed up immediately we started planting our produce. The agric officer prescribed some chemicals to use, but it has not yielded any positive result as you can see. Francis Yalfri is therefore appealing to agricultural researchers and scientists to come out with some pragmatic measures and chemicals that could effectively control or prevent the fall army worms. Felix Atakwabna explained how the fall army worms are destroying their farms and said if the situation is not brought under control quickly, Ghana might experience food security problems. That uh, worms are inside, you see. So whenever you apply a, a chemical, you need to uh, put the chemical inside because they are not outside. So they start uh, uh, spoiling the leaves within the inside. And after the leaves will come out, you will see them this way. Meanwhile, Brown and Half Regional Director for Minister of Food and Agriculture, Dr. Sir Quist, has assured farmers across the region of the availability of pesticides at the various district and municipal offices. He, however, stressed that no farmer is expected to pay for the chemicals. Nestor Kafuya Jumes reports for Joy News. is Joy News Prime. Well, it is said the wise man built his house on a rock, whilst a foolish man built on sand. Now, building a home on rock or near rock at a quarry site, however, is not a smart thing to do, as it puts both your life and your property at risk. Quarry companies in the Shai Sudoku district in the Greater Accra region are particularly worried. Quite a number of developers are building too close 
to the concessions with implications for such properties during blast. And we want the Environmental Protection Agency to urgently move in before the untoward happens. Matilda Omega has more. The Shai Osudoku Corin Enclave is a vast area with about 30 quarry companies, with each site blast and setting of about two to three blasts each week. That's about 90 explosions a week, probably more than some of the world's most dangerous war fronts. There are communities that often complain about the operations of such quarry companies. But these companies, on the other hand, argue that rather than blame them for the impact of the blasts, the communities that are complaining are the ones guilty of encroaching on lands designated as blast zones and not suitable for human settlements. Greenhouse Estate, for instance, is put in a presidential unit approximately 100 meters from the operational area of the quarries. An issue, Alexander Dagadu of Cedar Quarry Limited says, is of great concern. If estate developer is close to us, it will be a problem because when we blast, there will be flying rocks that will disturb human activity. Not exactly, not only our land, but because of our, the nature of our operation, we blast, we drill and blast rocks. If it flies, even if you fall on the roofing, it will damage it. If human activities is going on, it can destroy everything. We can only announce that we are blasting today. We are blasting so and so hours. Okay. You get me? That is what we do. So that all activities around have to be stopped. So that if we are going to blast and the rocks fly, it will not disturb anybody. But when they are closer to us, it will cause trouble because we can be announcing every day we are going to blast and people are living in a house. It will be a problem. Because what is happening is even they take over some of our consensus now. Okay. Several letters written to the Environmental Protection Agency, copied to Minerals Commission, as well as the Shai Osudoku Assembly, is yet to get any concrete response. What, uh, what happened is that we make an inquiry at the Assembly. We belong to Shai Osudoku Assembly. We make some inquiry. The letters know that it is for washing of tankers. Okay. If washing of tankers, they will not make the layout that way. By look like a estate activity because they are now fencing around their boundary. We went to Miras Commission, we reported to them. The letters know that when it is human activity, it has to be 500 meters from our boundary. But if it is for equipment, it has to be 300. So we are cautioning the public to know that whatever happens to any inhabitant there, it will not be our problem. Clearly, the activities of these developers brings great discomfort to the quarry companies as it restricts their operations, especially the blasts. Joy News' attempt to get a reaction from managers of the greenhouse estate were unsuccessful. As workers at the site said, the general manager was away in China. The Presbyterian Church of Ghana is charging politicians to dispassionately discuss issues of nation building for workable solutions to the country's socioeconomic challenges. Chairman of the Kapim Presbytery in the Easting region, Reverend Dr. George Kwapon, said partisanship has become a stumbling block to national progress. He was speaking at the 75th anniversary service of the Asukwa District Presbytery in Kumasi. Mahmoud Mohamed Nuruddin has more. Reverend Kwapon spoke about the need to use politics to unite Ghanaians through development initiatives that benefit the entire citizenry. He wants Ghanaians to stop politicization of every national issue. Our own system of education, these are some of the things that we should be talking about right from class one and throughout so that consciously you realize that there are some countries that they, 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 are, they have the love for their countries. They have the love that I, I belong to this nation, so the country first before any other thing. You know, if you visit other nations, if it is about, you know, in a public place, whether a bus, whether this, we don't say that this is just a bind there kind of thing. You know, it's a government thing. People are patriotic, and that patriotism is what is important that if we have it at heart, it's possible. Reverend Alexander Akono Ampofo encouraged the youth of the church to persevere in every productive endeavor. If you are saying that you want to achieve the purpose 
by which God created you. Uh, you need not to sit down, you need not to uh, relax, you need to work seriously for that purpose because there are other things that is working against the purpose by which God created you on this earth. We'll take a break here on Journey's Prime.